will just briefly introduce myself before we start. I am Dr. Joanna Jan here. I am a licensed clinical psychologist in uh, here in the Philippines and in California. Uh, I work in San Francisco Bay Area as a psychologist for more than a decade. Uh, but I, I've been here now, uh, I've been here for a decade, working with the field of clinical practitioner. I co founded Circle of Hope. This is a non profit organization that um, strives to improve access and uh, resources for mental health for underserved communities. I'm also a co founder and executive director of Be Drive, which is a consultancy organization for mental health. So, welcome to our learning session on adolescence in the digital age. I entitled this session Wired because I think it reflects the radically different reality that you, young people or young people, are growing up in. You're constantly plugged into technology and social media that, you know, we, that was never our reality. We grew up in different times. So the emergence of smartphones, which was only about two decades ago, it has altered our, it has altered human development in a very radical way. So what took about 2 million years of human evolution to shape in terms of our brain capacity, our attention, to be able to with each other, um, and our capacity for reflecting and deep thinking, those things are being changed so quickly just over the last of smartphones. So digital age has disrupted human life and human development. And in this session, we're going to take a step back. Now, I, I'm going to invite you to take a step back so that we can understand these changes and how they affect us on a societal and personal level. So recently, I don't know if you've heard this on the news, 41 U.S. states have launched a class action suit against Meta. Meta, right? We own Facebook and Instagram. 41 U.S. states um, have launched a class action suit against Meta for knowingly using very powerful technology that has that they know has addicted to young people. Right? So, and this fuels the mental health crisis. So, Basically, we want to learn how to outsmart our smartphones. We're not rejecting it, but we need to outsmart our smartphones by being wise about how we use it for our real benefit. So there are four major things that we will discuss today. First, we will talk about the current picture of the policy of being. And then we will discuss how tech devices affect the brain. What changes has it been making for our brain? Actually, not just for young people, but also adults, um, older people uh, like me, you know, and others. We will then talk about digital stress. What is the unique uh, stress or it introduced to us by technology? And um, most importantly, how do we take control over technology so that we are the ones making the choices? We are the boss of technology, not technology being the boss of us. And in this conversation, mindfulness is the key. So I want you to meet Rina. I'm going to read this, uh, this scenario with you. But as we read this, try to reflect in what ways do my experiences reflect what is going on for me? Okay. So Rina is an 18-year-old college student. She checks her phone often for chat group messages from her friends and classmates. At home, she tries to focus on doing her schoolwork but finds herself distracted as she toggles between chat messages on Discord, Messenger, IG, her schoolwork, and the YouTube video playing in the background. Relate? 
Relate na relate? She doesn't want to miss out on the conversations of her barkada. Super relate. And they also enjoy playing online games together, so she usually stays up late to spend time with them. She wakes up in the morning feeling tired and sluggish and panics when she, reali she realizes she still has more pages to read from her history class for their quiz today. This seems to be her daily routine and she often finds herself feeling drained and having low energy. Okay. I just want to invite you to reflect on, on this case scenario, on our friend Rina. And let's see in what ways Rina's experience is also our experience. How common is Rina's experience among your peers and adolescent in general? Common? Not common? <laughs> Who says it's common? Who among you says it's a common experience? Okay. What aspects of Rina's experience can you relate with? Maybe one or, if I can hear maybe from one or two people, what aspects of Rina's experience can you relate with? I relate to Rina in a way that um, with the having uh, multitasking, you know, uh, going to the sport and then doing her homework, and then well, there's a YouTube video playing in the background. I relate to that a lot, especially uh, during the pandemic. I see myself especially that you know I use my laptop for online classes. It's just an all class. I'm an all time away from distractions. And again, it's easier to play fast and get distracted. I'm trying to lessen the habit. It's still there, but however, I am improving a lot. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. So with the online learning, it was easier to, to multitask. So we have several tabs open, several devices around us while we are doing our schoolwork, right? So um, there, there are multiple distractions, and it's easy to plug into multiple channels of information, conversations, right? But you're also consciously trying to change that, maybe because you're feeling that um, it hasn't been very healthy for you. Okay. What, what needs does Rina have that drives her behavior? Because we don't want to judge ourselves. We don't want to judge Rina. We just want to be mindful of what's going on. Mindful and curious. What is this? So, in what ways can you relate with Rina's needs? What do you think is she need? So, for me, I think Rina, using the social media platforms, is a way for her to connect with a lot of people or to connect with her friends because that's the best way for her as an adolescent. So connection is very important to human beings. The most basic, deepest motivator is connections. And it's particularly important in adolescence because the sense of belonging helps you feel safe, but it also helps you understand yourself. It's the context in which you're beginning to understand yourself in relation to others. So, connecting and belonging is important to Rina, right? And, and with, with the social media um, and the accessibility of so many chat groups and online platforms, we don't want to miss out on anything that's going on, right? We want to belong everywhere. Now, are there ways for to have a healthier relationship with technology? Are there ways for us to have a healthier relationship with technology? And if yes, how? So the current state of adolescent well-being, the, the, the curve has changed. Um, with the pandemic, we saw that uh, adolescents were really heavily impacted emotionally uh, by, you know, by isolation and the lack of social connection. For those two plus years that we were in the thick of the pandemic, depression has become the leading cause of adolescent illness and disability. So it's not a physical illness, 
but it's a mental health illness that is uh, the leading cause of disability among, among adolescents. One in seven adolescents, and I think this is a very conservative statistic, um, experience mental health disorders. Today's young people, according to Stanford, are chronically sleep deprived. So, um, you, we need at least seven to nine hours of sleep. Uh, if you're if you're in your adolescence, you can even have more than nine hours. But uh, many adolescents these days are sleep deprived, sleeping much much less than that. And the the problem is when we lack sleep, it causes instability in our attention, in our in the way we regulate our emotions. And greater social media use has been associated with higher levels of anxiety, depression, worse sleep, and particularly among females, body image issues and eating disorders. This doesn't only happen in females, but we found that it's significantly more this, the incidence or the prevalence of body image issues and eating disorders is significantly more among females. So very important in research in Dr. Jean um, Twenge, which showed that since 2012, 2012 is the first year when um, the majority of Americans own smartphones. So this research is based in the U.S. The rise in screen time, what they saw is the rise in screen time. So, habang tumataas yung may mga teens na may access to smartphones, that that increase has gone hand in hand with decrease in teens' self-esteem and satisfaction with life. So, there's a lot of information that shows us um, digital media exposure really has a big They they uh, they discovered that teens who spend more time on screens and less time offline activities tend to have reduced well-being. And adolescents spending a small amount of time on electronic communication were the happiest. So so far, that's the current state of where the studies are. This is change, but currently this is what we're seeing. This is the trend we're seeing. What aspects of digital media affect mental health? I'm sure you have different thoughts about this because you experience this a lot. But, um, but some of the things that we found in research is that uh, what one of one of the effects digital media has on mental health is because it lessens in-person social interaction. So um, we get we get a lot of regulation benefits that we regulate natin ang ating stress and emotions through our connection, through our relationships with each other. But so much of that happens non-verbally. You know, like we're face-to-face -face now. Diba? Um, I'm here with you. We're here together. Our nervous systems are interacting in a very dynamic way. It doesn't happen that way in, in social media, right? So we lose the non a lot of the nonverbal dynamics that's going on between us. Another impact is on sleep. So with less sleep, we're likely to have worse mental health. Um, the issue also of cyberbullying. I don't know how many of you have experienced this. Not uncommon, right? So the experience of cyberbullying and toxic online environment, um, cancel culture, you know, um, you know, the consciousness around being liked or not liked can feel toxic. And then the contagion, you know, of and, and accessibility of information about self-harm, also doom scrolling, getting hooked, getting hooked in negative information that can affect our mental So, these factors lead to increased stress reactions. Our nervous system become overwhelmed and overloaded 
and it leads to vulnerability in mental health. Actually, not just mental health. Whenever our reactions go up, our physical health also goes down. But not all is bad about social media. You know, we have to kind of also look at it from a more nuanced perspective. Because um, teens do find benefits from this. You know, not just teens, but even in adults. And um, according to research, the most common way that teens describe the effect of social media is it's not positive nor negative. So a lot of teens feel that the effect of social media is neutral, okay? um, although they tend to see more negative effects on their peers than on themselves. <laughs> so among adolescents, there's, there's a tendency to see the negative effects of social media on other teens, but not so much on themselves. So that's very interesting. Bakit kaya <clears throat> Um, but also, teens tend to see their experience on social media as being more positive than adults imagine it to be. So, there are sometimes the intergenerational conflicts can arise. Why are you on social media? Why are you spending the whole day? Um, but for teens, that's, there's more positive experiences than what um, that's what then what adults think. So what's positive about social media according to teens? And I'm gonna stop in a bit to, to invite your thoughts on this. So according to teens, social media is is a source of connection. So eighty percent of those who were surveyed feel that social media is a platform for connection makes you feel more connected. It's also a place for creativity. So for those who are writing or making video essays or sharing creative work, they get um, feedback from, from social media and there's a platform to, to share it and make it accessible globally. It's a place where you can get support. So there are also support groups right, that happen online um, and also the ready response of friends and peers whenever they need help. And it's also a place where you feel accepted, you gain acceptance. So, so teens have positive experiences about social media, which means it's possible to use this in ways that support our well-being. But the important thing is it takes mindfulness. So we need to be able to really step back. Um, we can't lose our ability to reflect and to think and to be intentional so that we're not just swept away by the algorithms that tech companies are creating to cook and to make our attention. What do you think are the positive, other positive effects of social media? Another positive thing we can get from social media is the accessibility of services. For example, Headspace, which is uh, an app for our mental health. And also, we can easily dial um, emergency hotline. So in just a few clicks, we can access the service to help you. Yes, there are services, resources, and even apps that can support your mental health. Right? I use an app every day for my mindfulness practice and meditation and, I, and the podcasts, right? The podcasts that also kind of help us get perspective on life. I think they're also helpful. It's it can offer a lot of useful resources. The bottom line is the bottom line is our habits and behaviors with our tech devices affect our brain. So I know my own habit of waking up in the morning to check my vibe, uh, you know, what, what messages did I miss? You know, what conversations am I lagging on? As soon as I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking, I have to check my email. That wasn't how things were for me a few years ago, right? So I know that, that my use of my, my phone 
has already shaped my brain and you know how I live my life. It has designed my life. And we need to, to kind of reflect on that. How do we want our tech devices to shape our brains and our lives? Can we still be in control of designing how it's going to affect us? So what are the headlines on this? How do tech devices shape our brain? Number one is, and this is a hard fact, we are losing our ability to focus and concentrate. Have you heard about ADHD? No, that's a very familiar diagnosis, diba? Um, we have an increasing prevalence of, of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Not just um, not just diagnosed in kids, but also diagnosed in adults. Okay? And the digital, uh, the digital world most likely has a lot to do with this. So research shows us that in 2004, our average attention span, human average attention span, is three minutes. We can focus for three minutes. 2012, 1 minute 15 seconds. So imagine attention capacity, which has taken millions of years to develop, shrinking by more than 50%. 2012, 2016, 40 seconds. Do we really want to lose our attention? Attention is leading to learning, to reflection, to making important decisions in our life. Do we really want to do that? Second, the cost of interruption to the brain is more than what we think it is. Um, even for me, you know, multitasking has become the implicit rule and expectation. We need to be doing several things at the same time. Our brain has to be plugged into multiple channels at the same time. But the brain doesn't really work that way. When the brain shifts from one thing to another, let's say I'm working, you're, you're doing your schoolwork, and then someone messages you on FB, and then you, you pay attention to that, and then you go back to your schoolwork. Your, your brain doesn't just go back to schoolwork. It takes 15 to 25 minutes. You know, functional exercise, um, you know, studies in brain science, it takes your brain 15 to 25 minutes to get back to where it was after you shifted your attention. So, and, and we don't get better at this with practice. So, so if, if we're constantly shifting, the brain becomes and so we experience more stress. It leads to cognitive overload, meaning, yes, we're paying attention to many things, but what's the quality of attention that we're giving? it leads to superficial processing. We're not able to think about things deeply. Um, smartphones also undermine face-to-face -face interaction, the enjoyment. Okay? So people who dine or eat their meals with their smartphones, um, or ones who dine without their phones, they feel less distracted. And they turn out, it turns out that they enjoy their meals more. They are less bored, they are in a better mood. So eating without your smartphones, much, much better for your mental health. So all of this, you know, the, the, the cognitive overload, uh, the cost of interruption, the shrinking of attention can, um, can alter can alter how we are processing everything that's going on around us. But another factor to consider is digital stress. Um, and, and this is stress caused by negative interactions in online platforms or social media channels, chat rooms, forums. There are two types, and let's see what, what type we tend to experience. So type one is a form of digital stress that comes from 
aggressive interactions. When you feel like you've been violated by harsh, hostile interactions online. No, someone has said very nasty things about you, you know, and it's blasted everywhere. Personal attacks, shaming, you know, um, impersonation. So this is this form of digital stress is what we call type one. The other type is because we, we it's harder to protect our bodies. And someone's always trying to get in touch with you. You're smothered by messages. Um, you, you're pressured to comply. Demand for your photos, um, content. There's hacking. Um, the fear of am I able to really protect my privacy online? Okay. So the collapse of boundaries can lead to stress because we're unable to protect our personal space. So imagine if you're in your bedroom and someone just keeps entering without knocking, or even if they're knocking, but they're, they keep badgering you. Um, that's, that's really, uh, that can feel very stressful because we feel like we can't protect our space. So the signs and symptoms of digital stress overlap with signs and symptoms of mental health problems. Anxiety and panic attacks. Uh, the feeling of wanting to isolate or with because we get overwhelmed. Okay. The increased secrecy because we, we want to protect ourselves from, um, you know, from people who might want to gain information or post information about us that's harmful. Anger, depression, uh, problems with academics, you know, grades. And when we get angry but we can't really express it, we, we will become more defiant, we rebel. Digital stress can also lead to somatic problems, physiological problems, general body aches that we can't explain. So um, when we're experiencing these things, it partly could, it could be due to digital stress, but we also want to be thinking, am I also going through a mental health issue? Social media is transforming the experience of identity development and belonging in adolescents. Um, this is very, very important for us to really think about together because adolescence is a crucial time for brain development. So where you are now, this is a really important period for, your, for the development of the most complex part of the brain. So it's under construction. It's still under construction, um, but by mid twenties, around mid twenties, it's complete. Okay, and what is developing now for you are your it's your prefrontal cortex, your frontal lobe, the most evolved, complex part of the human brain. Okay, so um, it reaches its full maturity in in your mid twenties. No? So adolescence is a time for exploring deeper questions because your brain is evolving to understand and to you know to really kind of figure out those deeper questions so it's a time for defining your value what matters to me what am i going to stand up for what is going to be the purpose of my life so those questions are identity development questions. Where do I belong? Where do I want to belong? Okay. And that, that requires self-reflection. It requires the capacity to pull back. Right? So adolescence is also about balancing autonomy, which means you're trying to figure out, trying to think and be wise about um, in what ways do I want to be connected? But how do I also stand up for what I think is right? For, for what I think is important. Even if it doesn't go along with what others want. That's what's important to identity. Right? We know our core. We know what we value. Right? So, um, unhealthy 
patterns of social media engagement can lead to expectations of perfection. It can make us very self-conscious. So instead of being authentic to who we are, we give in to the expectations of others. But it leads to pretense. Right? We, we lose our true self. Because we fear negative evaluation. So when we're bombarded with the possibility of negative evaluation, it can heighten our fears of, you know, of, um, of being judged uh, negatively. And that affects identity development. That affects our authenticity. Um, there are other fears like risks to privacy that can make us more afraid to connect with others. When we are overloaded also with communication, um, it's stressful. And there are expectations of constant availability. So these unhealthy patterns can affect our identity development and the development of our relationships with people. Social media is FOMO's best and worst friend. Because we tend to worry about everything that we're missing out on. Which means sometimes we can't take a break anymore. So, let's reflect again. I want you to think about this. Which online platforms or groups make me feel safe or unsafe? Where am I in my online digital world? Where am I safe? Where am I unsafe? Where do I feel included? Where do I feel excluded? Where do I feel free to be my true self? Where am I uncomfortable being myself? Anyone wants to share? So uh, for me, uh, the safe space or the unsafe space that I chose was Twitter. Because for me, Twitter, I can post a lot of things. I can express myself in a, you know, in a very gen generic way for me. And in that way, I can express the stress that I'm feeling. But however, in that way, it can also be unsafe. Because when a lot of people see the post, they get triggered or they get bothered sometimes. So it's really... You know, it's like a given thing. So it gives me a safe space and it gives me a not safe space. Right, so it's both. There's a mix of feeling safe because we can express freely, but unsafe because sometimes you get reactions that feel harsh and it affects the way you feel about yourself. For me, my safe space is uh, Discord, Facebook Messenger, or rather when it comes to other social media apps, the the feature where there's personal messaging because I feel that intimate connection will never I connect, especially with my friends and my family. Meanwhile, the unsafe space for me is like Instagram or Facebook or rather where people see whatever I post or whatever I do on social media publicly because there's a lot of judgment even though whatever I'm going to put up there in the public Anyone can see it and anyone can judge me without them knowing who I am first. So you feel safer in intimate settings because it's possible to manage your social media groups in a way that it feels more intimate. It's you're connecting with people who um, who you you know you can connect with in a positive way. Um, and it feels less safe. If it's in a platform where you in, you invite all sorts of reactions, where um, where people might react to what you say without really knowing who you are. It's possible to like get over it farther from the question itself. Um, mm -hmm. If your personal thing on the question is that there's no such thing as safe or unsafe space online, mm -hmm. is you that are uncomfortable for the safe to get yourself like. In me, I mean, any, any platforms that you will be using is a safe space for you. Mm -hmm. It is maybe your responsibility to make your space safe. Mm -hmm. And for example, I often find use uh, Facebook mm -hmm. for like, 
be sure to make sure that you're not just loving friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, I might say that I feel safe right? because I am, I know, I might, I might be wrong, but I know to myself that uh, I keep my, maybe my boundaries online. And I, yes. you know, especially those things that I feel like uh, maybe it, uh, that has to be, uh, be, be private, I don't yes. research post and all. So I think yes. it's on the personal perspective of how to make your space safe. Yeah. Actually, okay, that's exactly the point. No? Um, that uh, that we can take responsibility when we are aware of how to create safe spaces for ourselves and for others and for others, right? So we can take control of how these online environments will affect. Um. Although to a, a certain degree, I, I would also say that um, our, you know, our tech giants have a responsibility for making sure that they are not knowingly using technology for the benefit of commerce with many adverse impacts, uh, with, with a lot of adverse impact on, on us. Right? But yes, um, there, there is personal responsibility that we can all take to make sure that um, to make sure that our choices in the way we engage in social media protects our safety. Um, and this is where <laughs> mindfulness comes in. You know? Mindfulness and also uh, the discipline of digital wellness. Because uh, we can have a healthy relationship and we can have healthy self-esteem while still using social media. So, how do we practice mindfulness in the world? We want to intentionally take care of our mind. What is mindfulness? So, mindfulness is the practice of paying attention to the present moment. Like now. No. Um, What am I feeling right now? Let's just do a quick mindfulness practice of checking the dials on our dashboard. What am I feeling right now? Any emotions that I'm recognizing and having? Whatever it is, just welcoming it for what it is. No judgment. What are my thoughts? What thoughts am I having right now? What stories am I listening to in my head or creating in my head. No judgment. Just paying attention. What are my body sensations right now? What am I feeling in my body? Am I comfortable, uncomfortable? Do I feel tense or at ease? Whatever we notice, we don't judge it. We just become aware. So we became mindful of body sensations, feelings, and thoughts. That is a mindfulness practice. You don't have to be sitting for long periods of time, closing your eyes, in order to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is what we do in everyday life. It's simply being aware. So mindfulness helps us become more aware of what's happening around us, how the different things that are happening are affecting us and how we feel. But it means taking time to slow down, unplugging from our distractions so that we can give ourselves real, genuine attention. Kamusta ba talaga ako? So, if one form of mindfulness is what we did, you know, and, and when you're in your digital space, you can mindfully check in with yourself. Right? How am I doing right now? While I'm on Twitter, I'm FB, wherever, Discord, um, am I feeling overwhelmed by information? How am I doing right now? How am I, how am I feeling about these interactions? How is this app making me feel? 
how did that picture that someone posted or I posted, how is that making me feel? Am I feeling like the pressure that I have to be this way? I have to get those clothes or I have to look that way or I have to, you know, chase that experience. Um, if I'm posting something, what are my intentions? And am I being true to myself? Or am I trying to go along? So be aware of changes in your moods. Notice any patterns. If there's anything that makes you feel or notice that this is not working well for me, make the choice so that we can feel safe. We can feel safe and we can use social media in a healthy way. Other ways to be digitally mindful. Stay away from tech at bedtime. I'm also saying it to myself. <laughs> um, our mood is affected by technology uh, and by sleep. So our, our tech devices emit, the, you know, emit a kind of light that suppresses um, melatonin, which is important to sleep, right? So when our we have enough melatonin, our sleep will not be of good quality. We will have difficulty sleeping, and our quality of sleep would not be so good. We we will have difficulty experiencing deep sleep, which is important to mental and physical recovery. So make sure that um, your away from your device at least 30 minutes to an hour before bedtime so that you're not um, getting the negative effects from the, you know, the light that the tech devices are emitting. Unplug. Okay. So we need to take occasional breaks from social media. Uh, we need to de de detoxify from constant distraction and expectations and doing things in real life can be a big stress reliever <laughs> so going out to nature um, having face to face kamustahan with friends you know exercising taking a walk we have a beautiful campus here with nice trees you know doing things in real life can make us feel better in a way that scrolling never will and then lastly, you can use technology to track technology. <laughs> but there are apps that help you track um, how, you're, how much time you're spending on your phone, if, if you want to limit it to a certain amount because it's healthier, when you're on it, what you're actually doing, and what your emotions are. How do you feel when you're engaged with, um, you know, with the digital world or with tech devices? So use apps. Use app to, you know, to be smarter about app, about, about technology. And then lastly, um, the key to digital wellness is making intentional and healthy choices. So, let's ask. Currently, in our in this present moment, who is in charge of me? Hannes. Am I in charge of, am I really in charge of me? Or is social media, is my smartphone in charge of me? I feel personally in some ways, my smartphone is in charge of me. So it's something okay. I also need to be mindful of. You all need to be mindful of. So you need to be in charge of the steering wheel because it's only when you're in charge, that you can choose the destination, right? So the destination of developing your full and best self. So the things that we want to consider in terms of digital wellness and how to stay healthy in a digital world is the balance of paying attention to our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health, not in terms of religion, but being connected with what I value and being able to act on the things that we value. Our social health, our connections feel real 
and positive and safe are intellectual you know, where we feel creative and not just kind of shaped in the way we think right? by everything that we get from our online world. We have time for reflection and deep thinking, important to intellectual health, and protecting our privacy and safety. So minimizing um, our access to online content that um, isn't healthy to us. So, again, who is in charge of me? Am I in charge of me? Am I in charge of the steering wheel? Right now, am I choosing the destination? Wherever, in whatever way you're answering that, it's okay. But we, that reflection informs our choice to develop our full self. Thank you so much for listening and participating. <laughs>